I hope you appreciate what a leader this man is. Um, he really has had uh, an extraordinary career, and it, it's a special honor for me just to be introduced by him because he is really the person who brought me into this movement. Um, it wasn't that hard for him to do it because I've had a lifelong personal passion and, and relationship uh, with nature, but making the connections tightly between health and nature uh, really evolved out of a process that Howard led that resulted in something called the Wake Spread Declaration, which I hope you're familiar with, and I'll uh, come to that at, uh, um, at a point in my presentation. Um, but I, I want to thank you for that, um, and I hope you recognize the extraordinary leadership that he has provided uh, in, in public health in this country. Now, I don't have uh, the energy that Tom has, uh, the eloquence that my friend Gail Christopher uh, brought last night, um, but I'm going to try to tell you uh, about a journey because CJ talked about uh, multi-sectoral work, about reaching out to new partners and, and new connections. And what I want to speak to you about today is one of those partners uh, who could offer huge potential as a bigger partner, and that is the world of healthcare. Um, so I want to draw those connections as tightly as you can and, and, by, and do that in a way that tells you how we as a healthcare organization that takes care of 11 million people in the United States, how we came to embrace this movement and see it as not just important, but central to the health of our members uh, and of our communities. But first, let me ask you a question. How many of you have already had at least 30 minutes of brisk physical activity today? How many of you commit to doing that by the end of today? That's a little bit better. You need that every day. Um, let me ask you this. For those of you who did have 30 minutes of physical activity today, how, me how much of it was outside? Come on, you're the nature people. <laughs> what is this? Everybody was in the hotel gym? All right. One last question, because if we don't take care of ourselves, we're not going to be able to take care of anybody else. Uh, how many of you had a nutritious breakfast this morning? Take your hand down if it didn't have any plants in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you all have some work to do on your health. So let me, let me begin to talk about uh, nature as medicine and the connection between nature and health care. As I said, Kaiser Permanente is an organization that takes care of 11 million people today uh, in the United States. Our origins were 70 years ago in the shipyards in Richmond, California, at other points uh, along the West Coast. Um, and our mission from that very early point was to provide high quality, affordable health care and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. Now, a lot of health care organizations have missions that sound like that. Uh, but not many of them focus deeply on how to implement that in everything you do. So what was different about Kaiser Permanente? The photograph that you see there, it's a little bit grainy, is a photograph in those shipyards uh, in the mid-1940s. And that is a staff physician who worked for Kaiser Shipbuilding Industries who is talking to workers in the shipyard, in this case about the common cold. Now, the origins of this organization were in one of the most dangerous trades around. And many of the people who worked in those trades were disabled, were people who had not been in the industrial workforce before because so many other people were at war. It was a very diverse group of people. Um, women were principal workers. You probably heard about Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter was in the Kaiser shipyards. There are still Rosies alive today. We know them and we honor them uh, in Richmond, California and the area around there. But people very quickly realized in this dangerous workplace that prevention was going to be the key to the health of that workforce. Prevention in the workplace 
and prevention in communities. Remember, this is a time before the widespread use of antibiotics, so a scrape on a nail in the shipyard uh, could result in a very serious infection and illness. So the focus on prevention was baked in. And over the years, Kaiser Permanente has found itself going more and more upstream to emphasize prevention in every way. Because our model is the reverse of most healthcare in America. Most healthcare in America works by doctors and hospitals and drug companies billing for doing something. Our model is the reverse. We're paid up front by you as an individual, by the government, by your company, by whoever is supporting your coverage. And then it's our job to keep you as healthy as absolutely possible within that dollar amount that you've already paid us. So when you go to the hospital, we lose money. We failed. That's a failure for us. When we don't do something right, that's a failure. It costs money. So we have every incentive to keep people healthy. But it's rooted in this more positive mission of how to keep people healthy and how to keep communities healthy so that people's environment is healthy. Our, our vision, as we talk about it, is a vision of total health. To be a leader in total health by making lives better not by providing medical care. Total health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being for all people. And so that commits us not just to provide health care services that are prevention-oriented, but to promote clinical, educational, environmental, and social actions that improve the health of all people. So that's the framework that I'm going to speak from today about this. Many factors shape health. We're a healthcare organization, but the reality is medical care accounts for only about 10 to 15, perhaps 20 percent of the differences in health that we see in people. It's a mighty gear. It uses a whole lot of money to do things, but it is only shaping 10 to 20 percent of people's health. What really shapes people's health is their family history and genetics, their personal behaviors, and the environmental and social factors that shape the choices that people have. So that includes opportunity, not just safe and health-promoting environments. So why don't we focus on those three bigger gears? Obviously, we need to. If a medical care organization gets to the point that ours has reached, where you're scoring number one in just about every category of quality measured by just about any other organization, then why are people coming back with their blood pressure 10 points higher, visit after visit? Why are people still dying in very large numbers because they use tobacco? Why are people um, showing higher rates than ever of diabetes? Why do we continue to have such problems with cardiovascular disease? The environmental factors and conditions that are shaping people's health and the trajectories of their lives are much more powerful than the medical care that we can deliver. So we have to be engaged in environments in a very deep way. It also means we have to change how we think about ourselves as organizations. And I urge you to think about this not just for the powerful, resource-rich partners that you want to have join your movement. Think about it for your own organization. We all take pride in doing what we do well and taking credit for it when it works. That's the left hand. We count it, we report it, we measure it, we tell stories about it. And that's important, and that can inspire people. But organizations that are more effective in changing social conditions, for example, I moved to the middle space about really making things count, not just counting things, but making things count, measuring the true impacts, facing up to what has worked and what has not worked, following the evidence, as Howie said earlier. Where we really need to move is to the far right of this diagram, being accountable organizations. Being accountable is different. It means understanding every impact that you and your organization have, good and bad, intended, unintended, strategically driven, accidental, 
understanding what are all the impacts you have. What can you change? What can you amplify? What can you mitigate? That is a tough thing to do. That requires uh, what the uh, chairman of the Ford Foundation recently called serious self-interrogation. Really looking within yourself and within your organization to say, do I understand all the impacts I have and we have collectively? Do I own up to those that don't measure up and how do I take responsibility for those? So we're talking about two ideas here. One is this idea of understanding and being fully accountable for all of your impacts. The other is this notion of focusing on the things that really shape what we care about. In my case, health. So if you believe that, then you have to address health at all levels. And as a healthcare organization, that means we can't just stop at the care that we deliver or even the education that we deliver to individuals and families. We have to be engaged in homes, in schools, in workplaces where people spend eight, 10 hours a day. Those places shape their lives as much as anything. Why should we not be concerned about those places? Uh, neighborhoods and communities shape our health in so many different ways. The society, our norms, our beliefs, our regulations, our policies, all of those shape our health. Now, that probably seems pretty obvious, right? But how in the world can one organization address all of those things? How can individuals and organizations make a difference in those broad kind of settings? Well. It was daunting to us until we started to inventory all the places as an organization that we have some kind of presence. Not just the programs we, want, we run, but the partnerships that we support, the organizations that we work with, the research that we do, our public policy activities, the facilities that we build and how we build them, the products that we buy, the practices that we have in hiring, all of these things have influence, but until recently, we didn't view those as part of the tools we could bring to bear on the challenges to people's health. And now we're starting to do that deliberately, and it's eye-opening. So let me get more relevant here. Um, I said the environment shapes our health. So look at this, the blue zones are zones where childhood obesity is lower than the norm. This is a map of the San Francisco Bay Area. Bay Area people, where are you? Yay, all right, so you recognize this map. The blue zones are where kids are healthier, healthier weights. Now, I could show you the same map for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, depression, and it would look pretty much the same. The red areas are areas that are unhealthy, where in this case, childhood obesity is much greater. The green areas are parks. We've mapped parks and obesity. Sounds crazy, right? Except look at the patterns. Isn't it interesting that the places that have the most access to, or they're contiguous to, or contain the most green spaces are the healthy spaces, where childhood obesity is lower, and those that are park poor, nature poor, where access is limited, are unhealthy. Now again, that might seem a bit obvious, and those from you with the Bay Area would say, oh, I know that area, I know Richmond, or I know this place, or I know that place, I can explain that. Um, poorer people live here, uh, uninsured people, they don't have as good an access to health care um, or to other kinds of things. But I forgot to tell you, this map isn't a map of the entire population of the Bay Area. This is just a map of Kaiser Permanente members who are children. Now, they're supposed to be getting the best care, the best preventive services. They all get it from the same doctors. They have the same health benefits. They have the same access to care. And we have radical disparities in their health based on where they live, not based on what we do for them as doctors and nurses, 
but based on where they live and what they have access to or not. So this is a powerful force. Place is an incredibly powerful force, and access to nature is a powerful force for health. Now, if we're out to change that, what are we up against? We are up against some extraordinarily powerful forces. Uh, this is a, the picture's funny, but we have systematically engineered activity out of our lives in this country. And we have rebuilt this country around the car. So if you simply compare in cities in America versus cities in the Netherlands, 77% 7 of our urban trips are biking or walking, 46% are in the Netherlands. We have a huge challenge. It's in the built environment, and it's in our social norms. And you're all familiar with the limits on the amount of time that children actually spend outdoors. So why nature? We've been on a journey, and Howard described it, the importance of following the evidence. We're a very evidence-based organization. So we began a few years ago systematically to look through the literature and to sponsor research to look at what actually are the health benefits that we can attribute to nature. And we were stunned. There are physical activity benefits, there are developmental benefits, there are mental health benefits, there are educational benefits, there are community benefits, and there are powerful economic benefits. Briefly. Physical benefits, increased physical activity, healthier body weight, stronger muscles and bones, better eyesight, and the restorative power of nature. Developmental benefits, social, cognitive, emotional, physical. Mental health benefits with respect to stress, energy, uh, inattentiveness. Some of you are familiar with the emerging science of awe, simply the power of awe the awesomeness of being in nature to create physical and emotional uh, benefits. Educational benefits, we're starting to see more and more about access to nature and its effect on creative learning, on resilience, which is so important to our children, on scientific learning, on understanding the importance of becoming a steward of the environment. Community benefits, it's very interesting to see things that you might not have expected, that access to nature actually can increase social cohesion, something sorely linking for so many people in our communities um, today. And obvious connections um, with things like property values and crime. The economic benefits are extraordinarily powerful. This is a study that was done about a year or so ago uh, in uh, San Francisco on the impact of the availability of nature on the economy there. Nearly a billion dollars a year in economic benefits. So there's an incredibly powerful, multi-sectoral, multi-purpose set of justifications for why all of these sectors should be investing in and supporting nature in everywhere possible. In our own commitment, Kaiser Permanentes, that has translated into a multi-pronged focus. What we are looking for in particular are efforts that target underserved communities, that are multifaceted partnerships where we connect with other partners unlike us who bring different things to the work. And we amplify other people's work rather than we prescribe what others should do. Um, we have um, we almost always are looking to link it um, to active living because that's how we got into this in the first place. We've had a huge emphasis on walking and rolling and routine brisk physical activity for everyone as a means of improving people's health. It is much more powerful than most of the other interventions uh, that one could be prescribed. And so we helped build Everybody Walk, a national movement that now involves over 250 organizations across the country. But that focus on activity is what brought us face to face with issues of equity and issues of lack of access to the natural environment. 
that really brought us into this movement because we immediately began to confront situations in communities where people were saying, it's nice for you to tell us we should be out walking and our kids should be out playing rather than on the couch playing games or watching, uh, playing video games or watching TV. But you don't live in my community and my child is safer there. Or we don't have access to the place you're talking about because the buses don't go there. So it drew us more and more if we cared about physical activity in communities, we had to move into the space of safe spaces of access to places that were natural environments and to the very existence and helping support the very existence of those places. So that's what brought us in to this work. I think you and we can work together to bring many other healthcare organizations to that same understanding and that same kind of approach. We even brought it into our marketing. So what you see is an ad that we had up for several years. Um, don't tread on me. Do tread on me. Do tread on the path that goes to nature. We've made a major commitment, as I said, to helping communities organize, to have safe spaces in their communities. Our work on walking, which I just described, has enormous co-benefits. You can't talk about walking if you don't talk about walkability. Um, but it takes you into everything from workforce wellness to equity and democratic engagement to the minute you start to try to reach and exhibit in a, in a goal like having everybody be able to walk and roll. Uh, and physically be active. Physical activity as a vital sign. Many of you have heard of park prescriptions or walking prescriptions. We've taken that a step further in making physical activity a vital sign. So just as you are asked by your doctor, do you smoke or did you ever smoke? We first brought uh, walking as a vital sign and now activity. So if you're a member of Kaiser Permanente, you're asked at every encounter or you should be, whether it's in the emergency department or picking up a prescription at the pharmacy, are you physically active? How many days a week? How many minutes? What do you do? It's a conversation starter, but it's an important step to highlighting the importance of that. But as I said, if those spaces don't exist, that conversation goes nowhere. So we've had to be much more engaged in actually helping create those spaces. So just as an example, we were a major supporter of both the Beltline Trail in Atlanta and the Metropolitan Branch Trail in Washington, um, D.C. Very important developments to create access to open space and safe access for a lot of people. We've now had to go the next step beyond that because it's great to have those trails, but if people in communities can't get to those trails, then they don't work. So now we're starting to fund the trails to the trails, the pathways that get people to these very large scale kind of urban developments. Um, in Los Angeles County, we've been building what we call fitness zones, small kind of vest park, pocket parks, which also uh, have fitness equipment, durable phys uh, fitness equipment um, in them. In uh, Northern California, uh, we have had a program that increasingly is focused not just on supporting the creation of space, but again on finding ways to let particularly at-risk youth, seniors, communities of color, and residents for low-income communities get easy access to the extraordinary natural resources that are in those communities. We've worked with the Trust for Public Lands um, to acquire and set aside um, uh, lands in our communities. Uh, we've developed walking guides as alternatives uh, to car trips uh, in Oregon for another example. And I could go on, but I hope you see the theme here is how can an organization support access, support the creation of the safe spaces? And it's frankly been through partnerships with organizations like yours, not just at the national level, but at the community level that's enabled us to have things because every small thing that we do is amplified by what you and other partners do 
10 a hundred times over. Earlier I mentioned the Wingspread Declaration. The fundamental point of that is in one place, the signatures to that work have assembled the key issues and arguments and evidence around why nature is essential to human health. And I urge you to look at it and use it when you have the opportunity, if you haven't already. I want to conclude now, and someone once said, those are the two most beloved words in the English language, in conclusion, um, with two thoughts. One is that we need to keep our lens open wide. We can't get too narrow uh, in this movement. Um, for us, if this planet can't support natural spaces, we're not going to be able to achieve any of the objectives we have. So we have just adopted as an organization a set of environmental goals which will also um, support a thriving planet for the future and for our children. They include becoming carbon neutral by 2020 and by 2025 actually becoming carbon positive, meaning we will not only not be putting any more carbon into the air, but we will actually be creating a positive, beneficial effect. We've also adopted a goal that 100% of the food that we purchase for our staff, our facilities, and our patients will be sustainably or locally, locally grown, again, to protect the earth. We've adopted a principle that half of all the products we purchase will have no harmful chemicals of concern in them. And the reason we say half rather than all is because without disclosure of the chemical that are in the products that we buy, because it is not required for most things, we don't even know what is in most of the materials we buy. So people in the most sensitive business in the world, in a sense around health, healthcare organizations, generally do not know what is in the products that they are buying and using with very ill and vulnerable people all of the time. So we see that as a special area. A reduction uh, in waste to the extent that we will recycle, uh, reuse, or compost 100% of our non-hazardous waste. A 25% reduction in our use of water. And then adoption of Prince international standards for environmental for all of our operations um, that will, can be certified externally and publicly and a renewed effort to collaborate with other organizations to achieve these kinds of objectives. But this is a fundamental part of that kind of accountability that I described earlier. Finally, I want to conclude with the issue of equity. We really have to get to the point of understanding that equal access does not mean <clears throat> equal quality and it does not mean same outcomes we have to have a much finer look, understanding, and partnership with communities in order to create the kind of access to nature that's truly equitable. I want to end on this note. Um, there is uh, a, a, a quote from David Orr. Um, E.O. Wilson calls it biophilia. Uh, Albert Schweitzer called it reverence. And Rachel Carson called it a sense of wonder. But by any name, it is the sense of belonging in nature and particularly in one's place. I think everyone knows that feeling to one degree or another, but it requires opportunity and the right circumstances to flourish. Thank you all very much for the incredible work that you do.